Hello and welcome everybody. Uh, we are going to be talking today about pruning perennial fruit trees. The focus is going to be on trees in specific, so we're not going to dig too deep into things like brambles, like raspberries and blackberries and things of that sort. Um, if there are questions about that stuff and we have time, I can pull up another presentation that uh, from last week that Patrick did, or a couple of weeks ago that, that Patrick Crouch did with us, and uh, and we can, you know, maybe try and refer to that if we have time. But um, without further ado, I'm going to go ahead and uh, start to dive, dive into the slides a bit. Um, I guess before I get started, um, I just want to say that I'm going to encourage folks to put questions in the chat. And I definitely want to hear what's on your mind, what, you know, what questions you have specifically about pruning. Um, hopefully, I'll address a lot of these things in the presentation, but don't hesitate to add, there's no bad questions, there's no dumb questions, there are all great questions because we're all constantly learning. And with pruning specifically, um, you know, pruning is a life, kind of a lifelong learning process. It's, a, it's, it's, a, um, it's something that just, you know, you learn more, you learn as you do. So um, I'm going to go ahead and start our slides here. This one. Okay. So um, I try to do uh, some kind of hybrid of of getting some real time um, experience with pruning uh, with <laughs> with pruning fruit trees, with pruning fruit trees. Um, so I, I took some videos, which I'll be sharing um, a little bit later on, and I took some images. Um, it's kind of hard to capture images of there's so many shadows and the lines cross so much in these images. So it's, it's hard to illustrate. So the videos will be helpful to, to show us, you know, uh, the structure of the tree. And then we can talk about what things we would be removing and how to go about that. Um, I just want to spend a few minutes and just say that, you know, kind of what, what I was talking about a little earlier is pruning is an art form. Um, it is not a science, there are some general rules, but uh, trees kind of do what they want. And, you know, from one apple tree to another or one pear tree to another, they tend to be somewhat unique on how, why this tree decided to put a branch there or put a branch there or, or, or um, so a lot of it is kind of open to our interpretation. And if I was to prune a fruit tree, um, we were both given the same exact uh, tree to prune and I pruned it and then you pruned it. Uh, we could both be following the same kind of rules but come out with a different outcome. Um, I think what I really want to encourage in this is that uh, pruning is maybe overwhelming or um, scary. Like you don't want to kill the plant, you don't want to kill the tree. Um, but as long as you're not, you know, you follow some of the simple rules and you're, um, you're not too aggressive, um, most of the time you can recover even if you make some bad cuts. Um, so uh, we'll, you know, get to, get to the, the details of that. Okay. So we're going to start kind of from the beginning of like, maybe a few years after you have, or within the few years of planting the fruit trees. So typically when you plant a fruit tree, you may prune it in the first year, um, maybe just, uh, just a couple cuts. The most of the time when you're getting new, new fruit trees, they look more to that that I had on my screen when we started of this little tree that I'm, it's actually a branch, but we're calling it a tree. Um, they look kind of similar to that, not even actually that much growth on them. But usually it's, you know, sometimes it's even what they call a whip, which is a whip would be one branch, maybe a one or two side branches. So when we're planting a, in the first year, not a whole lot of activity. Um, but then as in the subsequent years, years, you know, one, you know, in, in the year after planting and the next couple after that, 
um, we're just trying to set up the structure, the baseline structure of, uh, of what we want this tree to look like. Um, and we'll go into, there's a few different uh, techniques. There's three kind of main techniques uh, based on the type of tree and the kind of character of it. Um, so in year one, typically we're just doing a little bit of pruning to establish the form. And then in year two, we're just looking at for um, possible dead branches, crossing branches, um, and then just kind of encourage what you know what we had started with our baseline of the first year and trying to um, you know shape the the tree filling out um, the kind of space of where it's ultimately going to live um, and branches filling out those spaces and then year three and beyond we're just trying to maintain uh, the canopy to be open encouraging airspace and uh, kind of thinking about um, that the fruit, you know, has a good place to establish itself. So this image will help us think, there's a little bit of terminology here, and I wanted to just use this to help illustrate some of the terminology. Okay, so in on this image, uh, we have a main trunk going up the center and uh, kind of veering off slightly to the left there, what would be called our central leader. Um, and this doesn't apply to all trees, but this is like, if a tree has that kind of main tendency to have a central leader, and we'll talk about, in this case, it would likely be an apple tree or potentially a pear, um, but they have to, because they tend for that kind of more upright. And then off of the central leader would, would be what we call laterals. So that's the, or also scaffolds is another word. Um, and that's also kind of referenced here on the lower right. Um, Want to bring attention to uh, where this branch here, if you can see my cursor uh, has, this is where the branch meets the main trunk is the collar. And it's typically a little bit thicker there at the collar. And that uh, these uh, several branches coming off of the main trunk would be called would be the bows or the scaffold um, or the laterals. Um, and note at this top here is that there is uh, these two top branches have there's a it's a, there's a weakness in this space because the crotch angle is narrow. So that's something that we're gonna talk more about, but that's just, um, it, you know, if you think about how, if that branch on the right would ultimately have fruit set on it and a lot of weight and pulling on it, if because of that nature that there isn't a strong collar, uh, like we're seeing here on the lower left branch, um, it'll be prone to breakage and falling, you know, and uh, under under um, under the the weight of a lot of fruit. And then um, water shoots or water sprouts would be tend to be uh, growth that happens every year that shoots up, uh, uh, usually straight vertical off of branches. Um, so there'll be lots of, in some cases. Uh, you know, pears in particular to send a lot of water shoots up and we're usually uh, thinning those off and cleaning them up. They oftentimes don't have a whole lot of functionality. Um, and then in this left, the spur system was, spurs are basically um, uh, the kind of the beginning of what is gonna be leafing out into the, um, uh, the foliage of the plant and ultimately the fruit. So that's something that we're uh, paying attention to uh, based on time, timing of when we prune and we don't wanna damage those spurs. Um, and we also don't want to remove too many spurs in, in the time of, of when we are pruning uh, a tree, a particular tree. How are we doing so far with the chat? We have one question from a um, garden resource program just about if there's access to help with digging holes for 
um, planting fruit trees or other trees? Unfortunately, no. Um, we currently don't have that kind of capacity to help with planting, um, but we definitely can give advice and talk through the process. And we'll be gig we have a class coming up in a few weeks on uh, more focused on uh, just planting and care of fruit. And we'll be talking about the ins and outs of that. Um, but in terms of assistance, unfortunately, we do not have the capacity for that currently. Uh, so there's three main styles of pruning and we're gonna get in depth on each of them. And then we'll get dig into the tools and uh, some kind of finer points. Um, so in the image on the left would be the central leader. You see that we have main stalk, the tree going up, and then we have scaffolds with branches um, coming off to the left and the right. And if we were looking at, in each one of these, if we were looking at a top view of the tree, we were we would really like to be looking at the spokes of the wheel. So there's um, there's branch filling out from a top uh, top view perspective. So um, uh, unless the only reason that we the only kind of uh, application that we wouldn't necessarily have that filling out spaces if we were doing a spalier or a spalier style, which is, is you know, which is intended to be kind of grown along a fence line or a building, um, which you're just pruning to, a, you know, a two dimensional uh, two ways instead of all, all kind of 360 view. So again, we have uh, the central leader with the scaffolds. Um, scaffolds we're wanting to be two to two and a half to three feet apart, ultimately. Um, in the modified central leader, we are thinking about that scaffold system, but then once we get towards uh, a certain point in the tree growth around six to eight feet, then we are kind of modifying it to be uh, kind of open in the center. Um, and this applies to, uh, we'll get, I guess we'll get more in depth on the fruit varieties in a second. And then the third is the open center or vase shape style. And this is where trees that are, are prone are, are kind of inclined to have multiple um, main leaders. And we're trying to shape those to be like an upside down, down umbrella kind of to fill out the space of the tree. Okay. Um, okay, so central leader system, which was that first one we were looking at, is uh, um, we are thinking about that mostly for air, uh, apples and pears. Um, we are trying to prune it in such a way to encourage horizontal branches rating from the, uh, the scaffolds um, of, the, of the main trunk um, and uh, encouraging each scaffold to have branches filling out in a compass direction. Again, if, imagine if you were viewing it from the top with this, like spokes of a wheel um, all kind of emanating to fill out the space. We would be establishing our scaffold to uh, where our first branches are about two and a half to three feet off of the ground. So we're move, removing any branches below that. And then we are spacing out each scaffold. So if we have, um, let's see. So in this case, you know, we would leave this lower scaffold. We were leaving this lower scaffold. I don't know if you guys are seeing that. And then another one here, but we'll get into the camera a little bit more. Okay. From the side, we are trying to illustrate and hope. So like in this, the right side of this image, we are essentially trying to imitate um, 
what a Christmas tree would look like with this style of pruning. Um, I would say in this image, this is helpful. Um, this is kind of the progress over uh, several years of what the tree would develop to look like. The only, only uh, uh, edit I would make on this image is these branches look really low. I would really start more, it looks like these couple first two, three branches are pretty close to the ground and we would really want that scaffold to start up at the, you know, closer to two and a half, three feet from the ground. So again, you know, in the first couple of years of pruning with these tech, this type of technique would be, you know, the tree may come looking like the A here on the left. And uh, we're just maybe removing a couple branches and, and waiting a year or two. It's never like a perfect, it never kind of comes out in a perfect thing. And sometimes the branches do weird turns and such, but we're always trying, you know, based on what the tree presents, the closest kind of proximity of what would be a branch, you know, that makes ideal for, for what our intention is. The second style of, of pruning would be the modified central leader. Um, and uh, basically, it's just taking the concept of that first variation of, of having those scaffolds. And we're gonna, um, and then when we get towards above six to eight feet, we are thinning it out and opening it up um, to, to what is, we're gonna talk about in the next slide, which is, or the next section in, in, in the base style or the open center style. So basically it's a combination of the central leader style uh, kind of this uh, Christmas trees type structure. And then at the top, creating this open center kind of base like uh, with a few main branches filling out that space. This is really great for um, trying to keep trees size in check. Uh, and that's based on the type of tree that uh, you are planting. So there's dwarf trees, there's semi dwarf trees, there's standard size trees. Um, most of the time, the trees that we, we encourage folks to grow are more towards the semi-dwarf. Um, and that is simply because uh, dwarf trees um, tend to have weaker root systems and are not as tolerant of you know, poor soil conditions, which are sometimes the case when planting in the city. Um, and they require staking. Um, so they're just not kind of as independent, as hardy as uh, something like uh, the semi-dwarfs. Um, and uh, the good fit for this type of pruning would be pears, tart and sweet cherries, um, some plum varieties and some apple varieties. And here's kind of an illustration of what would a, a modified central leader be kind of over time. You'll notice that um, these, you know, like on this first image, these branches, we would call, like we would like to be calling them laterals. We want them to really, if we're talking about this kind of Christmas tree, we think of a Christmas tree, they go out directly out sideways from the main trunk of the tree. Um, but in this case, they're definitely not there. They, they will tend to go, you know, bend down in time. Our main uh, interest in uh, when we're developing the tree is to make sure that we're uh, focusing on the branches that have those uh, close to a 90 degree crotch angle. And, uh, and then we can also do a little bit of training with either sticks or tying, um, tying some, uh, some kind of flat string or tape to the branches to bend them down and over time they will uh, they will stiffen up in that kind of orientation. Um, a couple of thing other things to so in in the open open center oh wait is there anything else I want to say here um, I think that, so this would be, you know, we can see like if this lower left branch um, is gonna ultimately have three or four more branches filling off of it. So we're 
we're always kind of thinking every time we do a pruning, um, we're kind of thinking about where, where the bud is. So on a particular branch, um, you can you can kind of follow the branch down and you can see buds at different intersections and they'll they'll be facing different sides of the branch um and so let's see if i have an image that we can reference so you guys see that that with these buds okay so there's um uh, there are, you know, there's this in the kind of in the background here on this branch, there is a bud close to this main stem. And then there's one on the top further back. So they will be kind of on all on, you know, all three, four sides of a branch. And so we're selecting if we're heading that branch back, uh, for cutting it back to a shorter length, then we would cut it back to where a bud is. And we would also consider the direction that that bud is facing for what we want you know, what area of the uh, tree growth we want to fill out. You know, if there's an open space that doesn't have, uh, if we're imagining looking at the tree from the top and we we're imagining where we want to have branches grow to fill out, then we're trying to encourage those buds that are, would be filling out open spaces. You know, were you looking at a different image? Because we're just seeing the modified central leader oh, pruning yeah. slide. Yeah, okay, yeah, yeah. So then, thank you. Okay. Okay, you see that? I see something trying. I think I see like a sound bar. Oh man, that's a bummer. <laughs> my videos can show. I thought I could share out right out of my. Um, For some reason, I can't see. Okay. Uh, Got it. Um, let me just try one more thing. Um, How about that? There it is. Okay, great. Now we can watch our videos later. Um, yeah, again, these are the the buds. I just wanted to show an image of buds on branches and that they they grow on different sides. And then when we are pruning, we're pruning back, choosing pruning back to a bud that is gonna help um, form the tree later on down in its life. So. Uh, on this bud, which one would you prune? Uh, it's not probably not actually a great example because they're all pretty close to the trunk here. If I was gonna, um, we'll try and come up with I, this. This was just I knew I had, a picture, had this picture on hand. It's not for in terms of what pruning. I wouldn't. We'll try and illustrate that a little bit later. Um, Okay. Is this an image of like the time of year that you would prune to? Like, is that like the well, yeah, like we're, phase we're, that yes, be in? yes, definitely. We're going to get into that, but essentially now is the time. Um, oh. So, yeah, we will definitely talk about in a, in a few slides here. We'll talk about timing. Uh, so just kind of continuing on the different systems or different types of pruning styles. Um, the third and final of this series would be the open center or vase style system. Um, so this is uh, basically for trees that really um, are inclined to have multiple main branches. And so we're just kind of working with that. Uh, peaches would be the main one and some varieties of plums. So essentially from that roughly two foot off of the ground, we are trying to encourage, you know, three to five main branches that are gonna come up and fill out the space. 
and then filling out branches off of them. Um, so this is a little bit pixelated vision of, of that. So we have you know three or four branches here that ultimately over time are filling out. And from the top again, this would be that spokes of the wheel. Uh, here is another image just to give, uh, you know, I don't know if I would really encourage them to be all coming from the same point like you see here on the left, but it's still this top image I think is helpful and I, that's why I really wanted to show, but it, it does, you know, it has an, that kind of upside down umbrella uh, kind of uh, look. Okay. And so so after, so basically there's a couple different phases of when we're gonna be pruning fruit trees. There is kind of the initial phase where we are setting up the um, essential structure, the bones, the skeleton of the tree and trying to shape it in such a way that um, allows for it to handle good fruit set um, and it allows for good airflow and sunlight to get into the center of the tree to help with fruit development. And airflow, airflow also is important um, for preventing disease. Um, and then after that time, we are doing, we are moving on to um, kind of maintenance pruning. As a general rule, uh, we are doing some kind of pruning on fruit trees every year. Um, it might be just a, it, early, in the early years, it might be just one or two cuts. Or, or maybe it doesn't require it every year, but you should check and just see where everything's at. Okay, this one's good. It doesn't need a pruning, but they all need to have that baseline check every in the first couple of years. And then after that, we're moving on to um, where the bearing period for fruit trees. So most fruit trees will start to bear fruit in, you know, after three to five years. Um, so this is the time when, when you know, the structure is there. Um, and we're just trying to uh, encourage it to fill out nicely. Um, so we're maintaining the tree shape and height. Um, generally speaking, for most you know semi dwarf fruit, fruit trees, we're shooting to have them between ten and twelve feet, um, where they they may want to be you know they want may want to get up to twenty feet tall but we can prune them back and keep them smaller um, so we don't have to be climbing on ladders to pick fruit. Um, or, you know, we can be creative on, on getting apple picker if we really need to, but so essentially well, we're also working on getting uh, light into the center of the tree, um, kind of this concept of thinning out the congestion and uh, that we could see through air pockets there. It's not just, you know, branches over branches and, and no way that any, a bird could fly through it or you couldn't throw a football through it, you know, is that's one of those things is, is if you're looking at a fruit tree that's more established is uh, thinking about for, you know, one way of creatively thinking about uh, if, if it needs to be pruned or not is, you know, are there pockets where air can get in such a way that it's open that a bird could fly through or you could throw a football through. We're always uh, kind of the baseline of any kind of pruning is always removing cracked, broken, or diseased branches. Uh, dead, the three Ds, dead, diseased, and dying. Um, there are a few indicators of dead branches. Um, you can uh, look at the bark and if it looks um, dried up or cracked, um, uh, or it does you, usually younger growth will tend to have a bit of color to it. Maybe that it might be brown or green. It really depends on the plant. But um, so you can take your thumbnail and scratch a little bit of the branch, and you should be able to easily scratch a little bit and see the the sub layer of the top of the of the bark, uh, which is the I think it's called the cadmium. So it, it, it would easily scratch off and it would look green and alive, whereas a dead branch would not be as easy to scratch with your nail and will tend to be brown once you, if you do get your nail below the surface. Um, if it looks like a branch that you're not so concerned with, you can also try and bend it a bit 
they they if they're uh, if they're dead, they will tend to be uh, break easily and be brittle. If they are alive, they will have some ply to them and uh, and and be more uh, flexible. Um, and then another indicator is any kind of buds on a broken stem would break off easily and be you know be clearly dead. Whereas uh, on a live branch, you can see you know the what's something that's just about to bust open and pop out some leaves. Um, in this case, we are always seeing double leaders or branches that are really close to each other uh, that are, um, you know, we're trying to thin to, we're just spacing out branches kind of all the way around. So if we have situations, sometimes it'll be shoot up with two leaders will come up, you know, and they'll be kind of competing for space and it would thin, be thinning those back to one or sometimes the side branches will be really tightly packed and be thinning those back to one. Um, and then uh, any kind of branches that are crossing or touching, or you can see that they're actively, you know, touching, you know, throughout the tree. Um, those usually you're removing one of those because in the, over time, if they, as they get more uh, old and rigid, they will rub against each other and uh, be vectors for problems. Um, and then, uh, we're always looking to maintain, uh, you know, that the cutting main branches back to uh, that Christmas tree style for the central leader system. And we may be even, um, so like it, heading back is basically, and we'll talk a little bit more about what this heading back concept is in a minute, but we're always, if we're trying to you know, establish that uh, Christmas tree shape where we have the apex and um, we have the, as it, it spreads out and gets wider as it goes toward the bottom of the tree, then we would do, be doing what's called heading back cuts, which would be pruning those branches back to a bud to, to that shape of that triangle. So if it was around, so imagine if it was this big round, uh, you know, uh, shape and we're trying to have more of a triangle, then we would be pruning as we go down, we're pruning some of those shorter at the top, slightly longer, slightly longer, slightly longer as we're going down uh, that e to each scaffold to create that shape. How are we doing in the chat? Doing good, good engagement. A couple comments. Um, If there are questions that I missed, um, folks can come off mute and ask those. Okay, I keep going. I think we're good. <laughs> okay, great. This is an example of uh, another thing that we would be pruning off um, on a yearly basis. Water shoots. These are actually so these tend to be branches that grow vertically off of main uh, some of your main scaffolds and there it's the tree kind of trying to push out new healthy growth um, but they don't have much function um, or use when we're trying to have good fruit set and um, and have good sunlight towards the center these are actually ones that have probably been there a few years um, they, they usually they'll pop up to three feet in a year um, but anything that's basically, vertical off of a horizontal branch. Um, usually we're cutting all those off the top of the branches. And then suckers would be another one that's ongoing. And so suckers are shoots that usually sprout up at the base of the tree. Suckering often happens, well, I'm gonna refer back to this for a second, okay. So I wanna refer back to this graph union one minute when we're talking about stuff. so uh, I would say 99.9 .9 of the fruit trees 99.9 .9 percent of the fruit trees that we grow are grafted so they are uh, established on a particular type of um, root stock um, and usually the root stock dictates the size that the tree will get so um, it, you know it would be semi-dwarf semi-dwarf root stock or um, dwarf Fruit stock or standard root stock. 
and then you know the particular variety of tree so it would be you know they may have really great names like m111 and uh and um you know numbers and funny things like that but essentially an apple tree for instance would be i know that m111 is a is a stock and it's one that tends to perform well for you know mixed soil so that's when i try to get for when we do the fruit distributions for keep growing detroit and then we have uh what whatever type of tree that we want to be growing whether that be uh cox pippin or a you know um uh, golden delicious or uh honey crisp or whatever it may be that is grafted onto that rootstock so ultimately over the time of the true trees development um you know sometimes the the rootstock is so vigorous that it'll want to grow on its own and it'll send up shoots right off of it, the rootstock um and uh those will kind of be growing of the not the variety of tree that you planted the the golden delicious but of whatever type of tree that uh the m111 what kind of fruit that would produce so we're removing all those it's really common in trees like pears in particular. Um, so it's really an easy, easy fix. You just every year, it's even though it's kind of annoying, uh, you just got to cut them back every year. And then um, I know this is an example of, of that pear, you know, pears suckering. Um, okay, so moving on. Uh, and this kind of gets into what we were just talking about a few minutes ago about timing. So um, there's two main, you know, time frames to pr prune fruit trees. Um, basically, if we're trying to invigorate the tree, establish structure, and encourage new growth, then we are pruning while the trees are dormant. So the trees go dormant after they lose their leaves. Last year, they would have set all any of the buds that were going to produce fruit would be already set last season. Um, and we are just trying to shape that tree and encourage new growth now. So essentially, um, most, you know, we're, this time of year is, uh, is a good, it's a good excuse to get out in the garden and, and spend an hour and do a little bit of work. Some trees don't take too long. Um, I will say I really have been enjoying the task of going out to prepare for this class and, and grabbing some images and, and just being outside in the garden for a bit. Um, even though it's kind of cold, one of the first day I went out is pretty freezing, but um, we then the second day I went out, we had that some great days last week. Uh, so, you know, as the weather goes up and down, just find one of those 40 or 50 degree days. And that's just great for, for getting the pruning done. Um, so, uh, this, you know, the only thing to note about, you know, pruning during this time is if we know that the tree is more established as it gets a little bit older into its, you know, post three year, five year plus age, um, if we do any kind of pruning now, it may stimulate a lot more uh, branching growth in the later, uh, later in the season. So, um, and I've definitely experienced that where like I did a really good, I did a heavy pruning on one of my apple trees or a few of my apple trees. And, um, and then the summer set in and like, it just shot up a bunch of new growth. And I was like, man, I, I, you know, this is, you know, this is part of my lifelong learning with pruning, man, I, I wish I would have, how do I stop that? And so now, you know, I'm instead I'm going to be focusing on um, doing some more of that kind of pruning in the summer prunings, you know, where you're trying to um, make airspace. So basically, if you're trying to stimulate new growth during the winter months, if we're trying to, you know, basically create airspace as uh, as we need in the in the kind of establishing the structure of the tree, that would be done, you know, more in the summer months. Okay, questions. Yeah. Colleen asked in the chat, are apricot trees similar to peaches in terms of timing and shaping? Yes. Um, I will give this caveat. If you haven't bought plums uh, or apricots yet, 
I would discourage you from doing that um, because I've helped try, I've helped plums in particular. Um, uh, we, we've sold plums through the garden resource program for many years. And then a few, and I, I was having problems getting them to fruit. And I've talked to other growers who were having problems to grow them to fruit. And finally, I talked with the extension agent three years ago. And I was like, hey, what's going on with plums? Like, why are we having such terrible fruit set? He's like, oh man, the, my most experienced farmers with lots and lots of trees will get a good fruit set every six to eight years, like one fruit set every six to eight years. So all that said, you know, plums and apricots may not be worth it. I mean, you know, if you're, if it's something you're excited about, of course, try it. Like, you know, that's the fun part, but just want to share that kind of practical experience that I've had with them over time. Um, so that's just some food for thought. Any other questions in the chat? Nope, we're good. Okay. All right. Um, okay, making prune, proper pruning cuts. We are always trying to cut uh, as close to the collar as possible without cutting into it. And then we're always trying to avoid any kind of stubby branches. And we're basically trying to, so we don't, we never want to um, cut in, in the middle of two buds. We're always cutting back to a bud. Um, and then we're always, and then basically we're, there's two, as kind of referenced earlier, there's two main types of cuts that we're doing. We're thinning out, we're decongesting, uh, removing branches back to a crotch or a joint. And then heading back cuts are basically shortening branches, cutting back to, uh, to a bud. Uh, so this, so this would be a heading back cut where we're cutting this branch back to that bud that's just by the left blade there. And then this would be a, a pruning cut. So the collar is the area at the base of the branch, uh, branch that is somewhat new and thicker than the branch itself. Um, it's just a note like what, and it's come somewhat, especially with larger cuts, it's sometimes finicky, uh, tricky to get right in there and cut right into the collar. And we'll have some images to help illustrate this in a second, but, but you know, that kind of the, the tree has a natural setup in them in, in it to, help with healing. So there's natural chemicals that help stop infection and, you know, help rapidly grow scar tissue to cover that area and, and um, prevent the tr tree from any kind of disease problems. And, um, and then in addition to the pruning, as we're kind of helping the tree uh, develop its shape over time, another technique that we're gonna be playing with is training or spreading branches. So um, using, you know, a, a little stick with notches on either side to push a branch out so it's horizontal, so it's going sideways. So if a branch is tending towards leaning up, you can see that we're, you know, you can, you just gently push the branch down a, with your hand, then you could use a stick to kind of hold it in that position. Or you could take, um, you don't want to use string, you want to use some kind of uh, wide flat, you can get like um, tree training tape or, or you could use bike tube, bike inner tubes, but basically you want something that's not gonna dig into the cadmium of the branches or dig it, the skin, so to speak. Um, and then you could use that to wrap around the branch and tie off to a brick on the ground. You know, tying off with some string to a brick is one, uh, one other way of training or spreading the branches. Okay, getting into some tools. Um, these are the main three tools uh, that you will need for pruning. Um, these are these are my these are my personal tools in this image, and uh, 
I think they're all great. These are, I can give you the names of each. They're, they all do the job really nicely. Um, so at the bottom there are Felco pruners, F-E-L-C-O. I think those are Felco 8s. I've had them for 20 years and they're, you can get replacement blades. Um, those are by far one of my favorite pruning tools. Um, and they'll last forever as long as you don't let's leave them outside. Um, and then we have uh, some Corona loppers. Um, both the pruners and the loppers are bypass cutting blades. Um, so just to show you, um, the other type of pruner out in the world, and lo there's loppers like this too, are anvil cutting. So anvil is basically a flat blade cutting on a blunt surface. I don't know why this is still a thing. Like, it seems like in terms of tools, like it, it basically what it does is with that anvil, it's pushing the blade through the wood against this flat surface. And, and then you see at the bottom on this image here, there's the crush zone. Essentially you're crushing the bottom of the branch. So you're cutting it and bruising it at the same time, which makes, if you're trying to maintain the health of the tree, makes no sense at all. Like if you're using this for just cutting up branches of a plant that you're ultimately going to take out, then sure. But I think the amount of it, it just logically, I don't know why these still exist in terms of design, because I don't think it's that much more to make a tool that in terms of cost to make a cool tool with a bypass blade with where one blade passes the other and makes the, a nice clean cut. Um, you know, as opposed to the system where they're damaging, damaging the plant along the way. Uh, the third tool here is a saw. Uh, and I think that is, a, it's also a Corona saw. Um, and uh, another great one, it's super sharp and uh, really nice. And that's essentially that it, from bottom to top is what you're gonna use for um, the, based on the size of the branch. So, I want to show. So basically with any, any pruner that you're using, you never want to try and prune anything that's going to be bigger than will fit in the, in the very bottom of the crotch of the jaws. Okay. So like in this case, I couldn't prune anything bigger than the size of my index finger. If I tried, like if, you know, if there was a branch as big as this water bottle, I can fit that water bottle a little bit into the jaws, but this, this uh, you know, the, the action of this is not gonna be able to cut all the way through that in an efficient way. And you're gonna be damaging the branch as you're making that cut. So, whereas with these loppers, now we can fit, you know, almost not quite. No, I would say more like three of my fingers or four of my fingers into that jaw, you know, up into, you know, if you can imagine like circle here, two to three inch diameter. And that, and then probably more like two inch diameter. And then finally, if, if those two are not doing it, then you're, you're gonna resort to the saw at that point. So this is for the bigger cuts. Okay. Um, So when we're doing um, when we're doing uh, cuts with something like the saw, um, especially when we're doing larger branches, um, but yeah, any kind of branch that's bigger than say two inches in diameter and it's not going to be a kind of one pass cut, um, we always want to consider um, doing a three point cut, which is basically um, if it, it's trying to avoid 
getting halfway through the cut and then the branch starts to fall and then it starts to peel away the bark of the tree and that's problems, right? So uh, in the three point cut system, first we're doing a little undercut about six inches away from the bark or just a little ways out from the collar or where the collar is at. And then we're, uh, and then the second cut is just beyond that from the outside, we're just making it, cutting it into a stub. We're just cutting off all of the weight so we can, you know, eliminate the prop, the probability of, of the weight of that branch starting to pull down on it. So cutting all that off. And if we damage a little bit of the bark in the meantime, we still have that undercut to hold it from, um, from peeling that back. That branch comes off and then we're coming back and doing our precision cut near the collar um, and trying to get uh, a nice clean, you know, as clean of a cut as possible um, and, and removing that final amount. So, um, now let's just well let's add, open it up for questions for a bit and then i'm going to show some of the videos and and we can try and talk about some of the kind of give some real real live examples keto do you ever use that goop that um it's like black and you put it on the pruning cuts to like seal in like seal out disease and things like that mm -hmm. what do you think uh you want and, and it, uh the biggest you want the tree to do its own repairs when it can and when you know it's can so uh, you know if in most cases if it's the smaller diameter cuts anything you know half inch, one inch, two inch, three inch, most of those cuts will, if you, if you get it nice and you cut it into the collar, like we've been talking about, um, it's going to heal over really nicely and you don't need to do anything. If it's a large cut, and this is more for renovating, you know, large, well-established trees. Sometimes there are situations where it's a really large cut. And, um, in particular, uh, with some of the diseases, uh, disease prone trees like apples um, are really sensitive to what's called fire blight. And we are trying to avoid any issues, you know, with that being a vector of getting into the tree. And so we would maybe use some, some one of those painting products for that purpose. Okay, anything else? Gotcha. Helen has a question in the chat. Um, she says, my mature tree got struck by lightning and one side has died. Can I prune it or will the tree continue to die? Um, you know, yeah, I mean, it's without seeing the tree, you know, I would say odds are that the tree will recover and you can probably figure, you know, get it, revive it. Um, you know, basically a tree's health as a reminder of, of uh, um, learning about plant, how plants live and how trees live, there's the cadmium. There's basically most of the growth happens because of the outer skin of the tree that you know helps develop it. The bark, uh, the the the, um, the layers of the bark and in the, the top layers. So if that is girdled, if that's if that's cut all the way around. So if a tree you know, sometimes like a rabbit will cut around, will chew around the base of a tree. If they true chew all the way around the circle of that, the trunk, that cuts off all energy going up and down the tree. And it's kind of kaputs for the tree. It might try and shoot up some stuff from the, um, uh, from the rootstock. Um, so in that situation where it's dead on one half, likely maybe it got damaged, uh, some of that, uh, you know, some of that skin got damaged in that, on that side, some of that bark. And so that may have died off, but you can probably reinvigorate it by focusing the energy and the health on the other sides of the tree. Um, okay. Uh, anybody else? Okay. So, um, 
I'm going to go and show a few videos here and maybe this will help with talking, you know, give you some kind of visual aids. Okay. All right, so the sucker is at the bottom, but um, first off, I already did a little bit of like cursory printing on the suckers at the bottom, but I'm going to take those down a little bit. Okay. And you'll see on here, this, unfortunately, this tree has got these galls, uh, which is a disease problem. And we're going to just remove those galls to try and help give the tree fighting chance. So I'm cutting back to where there's another bud close by where I see the, where I see the galls. This would be an example of like a a water type sprout so that's just shooting up vertically usually we take those off here same thing another call over here this one i'm going to take all the way back and this branch has got a lot of galls on it so i'm actually going to take it all the way back to here Same here. If we look at generally at this tree, if we look at the shape, it's 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 a uh, we're kind of going for an open base style with this one. So we have a nice, uh, you know, some good decent openings here from previous years prunings. Uh, so we're not going to do a whole lot with that aside from cutting back some of the sucker internal like the branches that are crowding the internal removing the galls. We take off this vertical here. Gall over here. Here. And then little internal branches that are just going to make it uh, congested in the center. Thin those out. So we're ultimately trying to have this kind of like multiple fingers of branches coming up like a like an umble, like an upside down umbrella. And generally we don't want to take off more than 30% of the tree at a time. I'm leaning towards kind of stopping there. Frank, do you have any suggestions? In the interest of uh, keeping it from getting too tall, I might top a few of those. There's a, a big sucker on, yeah, uh -huh. some of that stuff. Next time I'll bring a ladder. <laughs> Actually, I actually have a whole whole here.
All right. Okay, so this one I'm just going to show this is a time lapse. So this is a smaller tree. And we're trying to I'm just we're going to try you can see it kind of happening in, in quick time. Um, and then we'll talk about it a little bit of the decisions afterward. Okay, so I want to back it up. Let's see if I can get it to a good. So here we were kind of going through and slowly setting up the different scaffolds. Um, and you can see that a few times throughout the the video we were pushing down on the branches because we were talking about ultimately they're going to be we're going to train those down to to they'll get slowly more rigid over time and then as we got more towards the top we were kind of focusing on thinning out some of the congestion of the really tight branches we want essentially we got we want scaffolds roughly every you know feet you know foot and a half two feet um, and so we got this lower scaffold down here, and then we got a, another scaffold happening around here, and then another scaffold, you know, happening around here. And then we're at the top, we're just trying to bring it back to one, one main branch. There tend to want to be two or three branches that want to pop up at the top. And so we'll bring that back to one. Let's see. Okay, so let's, here's another slow one we'll talk, we'll take a look at. So let's take, let's take these all off. You're gonna take them all off. Sorry about the muffled sound. All those lower branches. Removing all those lower branches um, because they're below that um, below that kind of three foot mark. And now I took the top of that one off because I can encourage this one to be now that the lateral. This will be the scaffold. And then in this case, we have two leaders that were were kind of that that cut I just made were two leaders that were trying to compete. And now I'm talking about moving that out to fill out space on, on this side of the tree and then trying to make choices up here on what to leave and what to stay to fill out that that third scaffold and now we have those at the top we got two or three that are competing for the top and we're going to make some choices there how old is this tree this tree is three years old There's a, a question in the chat wondering um, how you mentioned earlier, like the 30% is about as much as you would want to trim on a tree at a time. Uh -huh. um, does that, is that the same for younger trees that in their first three yeah. seasons? Okay. Yes. Um, it's a, that's a general rule of thumb that we use for any kind of plant material. Um, just if you think about it, like, they are getting their life from those leaves. So if you take off more than a third of it, then you're kind of, you might be compromising the health of that plant. It's subjective. And, you know, how do you measure that? There's not really a great way unless you want to count all the branches and, you know, say, okay, I counted, you know, 90 branches so I can take off 30. Um, so it's more of like, you could snap a picture or it, I guess it's more of like, um in the spirit of or an intuition or like you know just generally i'm not going to remove too much stuff <laughs> uh the one thing before i forget that i want to note is that 
one cool thing to do with these branches when you're pruning is to um you can make uh you can bring them indoors and they will leaf out and they will you can it's a nice little you can get a little bouquet out of them um the the buds will um will come out the leaf the leaf out a little bit and then you'll get some flowers um so that's always kind of a nice thing um for and to watch especially you got kids um to kind of experience um those plants budding out in the, um, in the late spring uh, let's see, let's try a couple more here. You yeah, can't hear me very well, so I'll try and narr narrate. So again, I'm removing those low branches that um, uh, are below you know, below the three feet mark. And I'm trying to figure out what to do to set up the next scaffold. You can see that those are kind of angling upwards. Um, and so we're trying to, we would definitely want to do some training on those to, to get them to fill out that Christmas tree shape. So three scaffolds I'm kind of looking at there. So that was a pruning cut. So I removed those to give room for the next scaffold above the one that's about my head head level right now. Removing the top uh, suckers and branches off of the laterals. So we're really trying to encourage side branching, but remove top and bottom branching. It was cold that day. You can see it in my face. <laughs> okay, um, let's do one or two more and then we can kind of open it up to questions. How are we doing so far? Anybody, any other questions? We can definitely come off mute now. So if you want to come off mute and ask questions. I know this was a pear tree right here. So we were talking in this situation, he was, uh, he was concerned about the tree already kind of leaning and what we would do about that. He actually, that's why he put this T post, this steel post in the ground, because he was thinking about tying it up. Um, because it's still a little bit young that we were thinking maybe, you know, he could also in the springtime or the summer, dig it a little bit and try and shift it in the ground. But um he he decided he was going to just you know tie it off to the post to try and get it to get more rigid once it's as it was held in that spot uh again removing those vertical suckers looking at what that low scaffold is going to be and thinning that out to be a few main, one main branch there. In terms of steps, it's always, you know, it's always easiest to clean up the congestion first. So so then you can kind of see what you're working with. So removing dead, diseased, and dying, removing vertical branches uh, or branches going up or branches going down that are on on the laterals, and then uh, and then you start to look for crossing branches and um, 
branches that like that are directing towards the center if they're if you're working with a multi-stem um, and now he's using that he's going to use that tire he uh, used a set up a piece of an inner tube tire uh, to be the tie off to hold the branch in place Okay, that's good for that one. Okay, we'll do this as the last one. How are we doing on questions? One question in the chat, Darius is asking, can you keep your trees to about six to eight feet only and they still produce fruit? Not six feet. I mean, if you could play around with, um, you would really wanna get, if you wanna tree, keep trees that small, you probably wanna look at getting dwarf trees, which like I was mentioning earlier, just require a little bit more attention for like, they're probably going to need to be staked um, and they will be more prone to blowing over and heavy winds. Um, but, you know, when you're trying to, you, you know, a tree that wants to be 18 to 20 feet tall and you're trying to keep it at six feet, it's just going to, you know, keep pushing out tons of suckering branches and stuff. And it, um, it just might be somewhat of an up uphill battle. Um, I think really you should, uh, you know, in most cases, you really want to think about more like, uh, you know, 10 to 12 to 15 feet tall. Um, uh, I mean, you can play around with topping them off, um, but I, I just think they're going to, you know, they're going to bounce back. They, they want to be a certain size, so they're going to send out more growth to, as a response to that. Okay. Now we're looking at a peach. This one is, uh, so these trees are about 10 years old. Uh, a little bit less. So, yeah, so they're really coming into what their ultimate shape is gonna be at this point. Um, not a ton of you, except from, uh, you know, every year we need to do some maintenance pruning for cross branches. This is a great example of cross branches here. Did I show this one already? Um, I'm sorry, did I show this one already? Okay. I don't well, think so. Okay. Well, I'm going to let it roll then. Okay. okay. Internal congestion. There's a few branches. If you get in close, you can kind of see uh, that the bark is, yeah. you know, starting to break. If you see splitting bark, you can, it's usually a sense, and if, if you try and bend it, not always, but yeah, it'll it'll break easier. That means this branch is dead, essentially. Um, so they're, they'll tend to be brittle if they're dead. Um, also point out that in here, I'm sorry, I get it. The uh, the where there should be a healthy looking bud is dry and yeah. you know and right, is... right. So that's another sign of a dead branch is when you see the dried up, as opposed to dried up buds. Uh, I'm trying to yeah. This, yeah, these are nice. You can feel they're kind of tender. Yeah. Okay. So we're going to move. Okay, pause. I just want to say that that cut, that was an improper cut. If I have to use two hands to use, you know, to try on my pruners to make a cut, then I probably should be using my loppers. This one, I think I'm just actually gonna. Okay. This does not look like a viable branch, but we are hopeful. And there's some buds on the end. So I'm gonna leave this for now. Because hope that would actually, you know, to fill out the space. Uh, this 
suckering branch to get rid of. Maybe we'll encourage this one to go sideways. We're going to follow this. This one's not doing much, and you can see that it's kind of looking bit, you know, pretty pretty dead and, and not great positioning anyway. Okay, I'm pause for a second. So you um, for this one, so I've been telling you if it's a vertical branch that you want to remove it. Um, but if I'm looking at the shape of the tree and wanting to play with some options, I can shorten that to a bud and then which stimulates a branch to go sideways, which could be helping with filling out the space. So that's you know where the creativity aspect of it kind of comes into play. Um, and that, you know, in, in looking at as it looking at it as an art form. I would do much more. We'll see what else comes out when it leaves out, but I think that's a good start. So we'll leave that one there. And I'll show one more video, which is a time lapse of me cutting a big tree, a bigger tree. So this is a tree that I've espaliered in my yard. Uh, so these are uh, two apple trees right next to each other here. Uh, this is, we'll just give you an idea of what I'm doing on a, on a larger tree, you know, to what it looks like kind of from the beginning and the end. Um, and that, you know, I'm trying to work towards that not much more than 30% removal. I'm doing a lot. In this case, I'm doing a lot of the sucker pruning and um, the vertical branches, trying to, it's a little bit hard to see, but you're, you know, you can see when you shake, I, you, the tree shakes a little bit when I'm cutting, you can see that there's a lot of, you know, branches filling up that space. And so I'm just, I'm looking for um, created like, you know, like below, you can see there's air space between these scaffolds, right? And so I'm in the upper, I'm, I'm just trying to do that same thing with creating that airspace and definitely doing some stuff to top the branches. Um, uh, I am kind of violating some safety rules here. Do not stand on the top of a six foot ladder. I didn't have my 10 footer with me at the time, um, but I did, I was, you know, part of it was I felt like I was able to hold onto the tree to stabilize myself, so. Okay, so um, let me do a stop share here. So that's um, that's a, a lot of what I wanted to cover today. I, at this point, I wanted to open it up to questions. Um, if they're in a, in particular, if you have anything that you're you know you want to do some pruning in your own site and you want some info on that. Um, I was kind of intending to maybe use this. I had this branch in the background that looks like a tree and I was going to show that a little bit, but I think through the um, videos that we've done thus far, I've kind of covered that. Um, so what do you think? What you, you got any questions? Feel free to come off mute or drop it in the chat. Uh, oh, so uh, for perennial fruit, um, Actually, the perennial fruit sale is going live Monday. Uh, so you can go to the Keep Growing Detroit store if you just Google Keep Growing Detroit store um, and uh, our online store and you can find uh, our, our fruit sale stuff is going live on Monday. Um, so we got um, two, two varieties of apples, Ashmead's Kernel and Cortland. Two varieties of pear. Um, there's a, um, oh boy, there's a red um, and there is a blush. And then um, 
there's a Flemish beauty red, and then there's a, which is like a blush uh, pair, and then the, a red, a true red. And then we have some peaches, uh, Red Haven peaches, and uh, a type of sweet cherry called index, and blackberries and currants, grapes and rhubarb are all going to be on the fruit sale. Um, oh, okay. So uh, George brought up a good point here. He said, did you talk about cleaning tools between trees? I was a little distracted. Curious if hand sanitizer is sufficient since I have lots of, lots of it right now. Um, so yes, thank you and good point. Um, you know, uh, pruning, cleaning your tools between pruning, especially if you know you have a diseased tree is a really good idea. Um, I think alcohol would be totally adequate. It would just be doing a wipe down on the blade. You could also use a little simple bleach, um, just something to little sanitize a little bit. Um, and, uh, you know, maintaining tools is another, you know, a lot, another class altogether, but, um, but just to shortly to say that uh, sharp, keeping your tools nice and sharp is gonna help you have nice clean cuts and that will just help the tree recover much easier. Um, okay. Anybody else, questions? Okay. Well, if that is the case, um, I think we'll wrap it up for the day. Thanks for coming out. Um, if you got fruit trees, now is the time. Try and get out there. I have a question. I do have a question. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, I've been planting uh, apple trees for over 10 years now, and I started off with two uh, trees. They were like semi dwarfs. And what I found was like what you did in that last uh, video that they became a chore to, to keep up because they got to around 12 to 15 feet tall. Right. So I, on my, my other lot, I did a high impact density and I put in all semi dwarfs, I mean, all dwarfs. And I found that to be extremely well because I got more trees together. I noticed in the beginning of your seminar, you said you prefer to use semi dwarfs instead of dwarfs. Uh huh. Okay. And was there any particular reason why? Because I have ten, I have ten dwarf trees planted, ten apple uh -huh. dwarfs planted on a lot, and I have to tell you, <laughs> I love it because I'm not on a ladder, all doing all ten. Yeah. And um, the question is, is right. do you prefer on these lots, which mine is like 30 by 118? Yeah. And that I would use, I should have used uh, semi dwarfs instead of dwarfs? You know, I am coming from the perspective of trying to provide plant material for gardeners who may not have a whole lot of experience. And so what is going to be the most, the toughest tree? What is going to be kind of... okay. Uh, and so I am not opposed to dwarf trees and, you know, there are definitely people who are making it work, but they are, you know, like kind of if in some situations people aren't able to be out there on the regular or, you know, they just, that's not their style or whatever. Okay. okay. So we, that's why we tend towards things that are going to be tough, but it sounds like you got a system together and it, and, and what you said totally makes sense. And I, think you know um you know under those circumstances then yes dwarf trees will, will work and especially if you know you have some kind of windbreak that is one of the concerns i have is like because they don't have as not a, a much of a established root system um they are maybe prone to blowing over um sometimes people are actually staking them or trellising them in such a way to prevent that and so those would be my concerns is just making sure that you have a plan in place um, to keep them from falling over, especially under. I mean, before they get mature, right? Before they get mature, right? Because, uh, and especially, I staked, I staked all of mine, right? As because uh, well, because especially when they start to have good fruit set, like enough, yeah. there could be the fruit alone could knock the tree over if it was heavy on one side. Okay, yeah, I, that sounds I, super I, cool though, and I'd like to check your site out sometime. Yeah, I have ten trees planted and. I mean, I, I love them because I can go out there and trim them without, uh, with the, with the loppers and the 
right. and, and the saw without getting on step ladders. Like I said, I started off with two trees some years, about 10 years ago, and I've noticed that I did the same thing you did. I was standing on the top ladder rung to trim them <laughs> because right. it got so high, I couldn't get up there anymore. Yeah, and I still have them, but uh, I decided that if I was ever going to do it again, I would put in uh, dwarf trees. So it, it just... Yeah. It just makes it much easier. And if you, you can plant them 10 feet apart and you can get the same amount of fruit as long as you are pay attention to the uh, cross-pollination for yep. the different cultivars. Uh, so, yep, yep, right on. So I just found it a lot easier. I, I noticed when you, you started off, you said you prefer that on the lots and I wanted to know was there a particular yep. reason why. Yeah, yep, yep, yeah, that was the case. Yep. Okay, that's all. Thank you. Yeah, right on. Thanks for sharing. Yeah. Anybody else? Hey, Keto, this is Joy. Quick question. Yeah. So, um, two things. One, will the slides and the video be coming out to us? Of yes. This okay. Yeah. The other thing is, um, so I had to remove um, an apple tree and a pear tree. Um, and I want to put more in, but I can't put those back where they were because I've already put other things there. How practical is it to try to... Um, grow like a, a dwarf like apple tree or something of that nature in a large like planter not berry or um okay can you plant trees in pots yeah would i recommend it probably not because i mean the well, one the one thing is that you need to um, protect the roots of the plant in that situation because, you know, with the extensive root systems that trees have, they can dig deep in the ground right. um, and they can access water and all that. But in a pot, they are limited, and so um, they don't they they have the they don't have the kind of extensive root system to uh, be below the frost line and protect it during the winter months mm -hmm. and also um pots just I mean, uh, it, container it, growing it, in general is is just it's a battle with water uh, it's always trying to stay on top of keeping that soil more yeah so, so for trees i don't think i would recommend it for some of the smaller fruit like brambles is i think is reasonable like you know yeah. raspberries or blackberries or something um Okay, because one of the other things I was considering, because I know that that didn't really seem like a great idea, was okay to try to contain it because my apple tree, um, I hated to cut it; it was really big. But like a bigger planter, but cutting out the bottom because, of course, so that the roots could go deeper. I mean, I don't know. I was just wondering. So why? So why even do a? I don't understand why even do a pot in that situation. Right. Okay. I thought it would help, sort of. To be honest, I didn't even know that there were like dwarfs and semi dwarfs and huge. Right. Right. But okay, I guess okay. that answers my question. Yeah, I mean, they're like explore. I guess the only thing, other thing I would say is like maybe explore other types of fruit that would be, if you're trying to look for something smaller for a particular space, there are. It's not going to be the. It's not going to be apples and pears. Uh, or peaches, but it could be there's a lots of berries and berry tree, you know, different types, Saskatoons or, you know, um, gooseberries, currants. There, there's like shrub, more kind of shrubby size fruiting plants that can fill in um, kind of smaller spaces that might be a good fit. And I guess that's the reason I don't have the space anymore because I put in a lot of um, berry bushes like uh, raspberries and blueberries and elderberries oh. yeah. yeah i wasn't anticipating having to cut the apple and pear tree so that's why but i had to right on that's too bad yeah but uh, okay i mean i'll figure it out because i definitely have to have them at some point so yeah word okay thank you uh-huh um i want to say thanks emily if you're still on the line i appreciate you helping me with the chat um and any final questions before we close out for the day okay 
I will be sending out the slides and uh, and the link for the video, which will be up on our YouTube channel. And uh, if you you know ever have any questions about pruning, don't hesitate to contact me. Um, um, I'll put my email in the chat real quick. Okay. Very good. Have a great day, y'all. Before you leave. Yeah. Uh, have you ever had any experience dealing with, uh, she was talking about growing apples and planters, and there's a company called Stark Brothers, which I buy a lot of my uh, my, my trees from. Uh -huh. They have a product called a columnar apples. Have you ever tried those? It, no. it, it's, it's a way to grow apples and planters. And I was wondering if anybody ever tried that because I was going to do that in my own at another facility that I had. They call columnar apple trees, and they can grow in in these planters. And I was wondering, have you ever had any experience with with doing that? I was looking for somebody that knew anything about them. I don't have any practical experience with that. Okay, I was just wondering because it. I was going to try it out, but I said, you know, I've got my, my plate is full, and I've got a lot of stuff going, and yeah. I. Uh, they they make these big these trees they're designed for these planters and they're called columnar yeah columnar apple trees and yeah but i don't know if anybody's ever tried them but they sound like a good idea you know how gimmicks are yeah i was just gonna say you know sometimes it's a gimmick i'm not sure if i uh but, but the stark brothers has a product is it, it, it they call them yeah i don't i mean they have I don't, I think Stark Brothers can be somewhat misleading sometimes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Cause I'm always looking for different types of, uh, you know, different uh, techniques and things like that. Different yeah. cultivars and stuff. So, yeah. 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 You know, um, I mean, it's, it's part of the, you know, it's part of the intrigue and the fun and the excitement of. of, of oh yeah. Oh yeah. 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 So, I mean, I wouldn't maybe try it before you bang, you know, get a few one or two before you, uh, you know. Yeah, I was, I was thinking about that. And, yeah. you know, I'm, the other thing is, um, do you recommend that uh, before anybody ever plants that they do a, a soil testing for pH? Uh, well, we definitely always encourage people that do soil testing. Um, for safety one, uh, but also to have a sense of the quality of the soil that they're working with. Um, but I can tell you based on just, you no, know, I've seen lots and lots of soil tests because what we've done over the, through the garden resource program over time and, you know, pH of soils in Detroit area are, are pretty standardly right around seven, if not. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so that's pretty much a bet. That's why we can't grow blueberries here. Yeah, because the, the, you need a more acidity soil. You need a lower pH right. to grow blueberries. Yeah. Right. Yeah, I made that mistake some years ago and yeah. the bush grew, but the berries didn't. <laughs> the bummer. Yeah. So, yeah, the pH has to be around four for uh, blueberries. So, live and learn. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, yeah that's always the case. I mean, that's really how you got to do it with, with, uh, with gardening so appreciate, okay. your, appreciate the info thank you yeah no problem okay good afternoon everybody get out there and do some pruning